Okay, well, uh, first of all, thanks to Bridget for the uh, introduction. It's actually great to be back. Um, I started out here 30 years ago as a chemistry undergraduate. Um, but today, in keeping with, I think, the future world's concepts, what we're going to look at is really opportunities for both entrepreneurs and also researchers here at the university to really impact the future discovery of medicines. But before we move on to that, I think it's really worthwhile just to share some basic uh, drug discovery concepts, really think about the current status of our industry, which is facing, you know, I think, very challenging times. But also think about how you know, your technologies and your new approaches can actually help to speed the discovery of new medicines up. So just as a way of a, an introduction, as I mentioned, I started out here at Southampton in 1987. And I'm looking around at the audience. I'm sure most of you weren't even born when I started out. Um, <clears throat> I was in the chemistry department. And in my final year at Southampton, I did a research project. And I think that was the time, really, that, in a way, my career sort of took off because I found something that I really enjoyed. And that was actually applying what I was, you know, was learning about chemistry to real life situations. And I actually moved from Southampton up to the University of St. Andrews with a, a young academic that was coming out of Southampton, moving up there to become professor. I spent uh, nearly three years up in St. Andrews studying for a PhD. And then I moved back down south um, to, to work for Phil Parsons, who was another Southampton um, chemistry member at the, at the time. Um, and I studied for a postdoc, and that really was involved in the synthesis of small natural products. And then I spent four years in a biotech company. Um, this was my first industrial job. Um, when I joined there, originally, the company only had two years' money. And that two years went on to four years. And the whole point of what we were trying to do was actually to take a project into development with Big Pharma. And we actually achieved that. And I'm going to share some of that project with you today. I joined Lilly um, in 2000 as a, as a team leader. So this is Lilly in the UK, um, working mainly in neuroscience. And then I progressed through um, to project leader. Project leader, effectively, I was leading teams of up to 20 scientists involved in, in drug discovery. My career sort of took a change in 2012 when I took on a group leader role. Um, effectively, this was still doing mainly science and drug discovery, but I also had a managed managerial role as well. I had 10 medicinal chemists in my group, and I was involved in mentorship and development of the group, which is actually a job that I I thoroughly enjoyed. As Bridget said, around about 2012, <clears throat> I started to help the university out in this entrepreneur and residence role. And that effectively meant you know, meeting people, researchers from the university, from the hospital, talking about their research ideas with the aim of taking some of these ideas back into big pharma. And obviously, at that time, I was in one company. So as you'll see later, that was quite restrictive. And now, hopefully, things will improve. Um, and this year, I've just started out uh, independently as a consultant. So I was up in the loft the other day, and I dug these old photos out. So if there's any chemists in the audience, you might recognize the, the guy on the left there with me, which is uh, Richard Brown. So Richard's actually now a professor of organic chemistry. Um, we're really very good friends. I've worked with Richard very closely over the years in a number of case studentships. Um, he's a great person to, to work with. But also, as an undergraduate at Southampton, there were also some really outstanding academic staff. Uh, one of which was David Garney. So it was David that I worked with in my final year uh, project, <clears throat> and I moved up to St. Andrews. At the time, he was only 32, becoming the youngest professor in the country. And Phil Parsons, as well, left at the same time to become professor at Reading and at Sussex, and I managed to work with Phil uh, in my postdoc. And I think you know, it's fair to say that it was a very enjoyable time in both groups, you know, both in the laboratory and also outside of the laboratory. So I'm going to set the scene now with two slides, which really shows how the training from my PhD and postdoc actually set me up for a career as a medicinal chemist in industry. In my PhD, I worked on HIV protease, which at the time was probably one of the hottest targets for AIDS. So um, some of you might not be young enough to remember this, but in the 90s, I remember these Grim Reaper adverts on the TV. AIDS was pretty much a death sentence for patients back in the 90s, and industry was hitting this target very, very hard. It was never our intention to discover drugs when I was in a PhD, but we were trying to understand how the, the enzyme actually worked. But alongside this in the industry, um, companies like Merck DuPont were actually um, delivering potential medicines. So from this phase, I really learned how to design medicines, future medicines, but also how to prepare them. 
In the postdoc, I continued in that theme um, around organic synthesis. It's obviously very important as a medicinal chemist that you, that you can make molecules. And so it was pretty common in those days to actually work on natural products. And I'm just showing one here. This is a very small natural product called anatoxin A. It's actually a natural product that's got some um, pretty nasty biological activity. It's pretty lethal if you ingest it. And it's contained within blue-green algae. And that's the photo that I've got there. And effectively, it's deadly to fish and cattle and dogs. But really, what our interest, or Phil's interest, was really to use synthetic methodology to be able to make that molecule very efficiently. And so for the non-chemists, I won't describe the, what's going on in that slide, but effectively in one chemical step, you're creating the skeleton of that ring system in one go. So this was a very elegant idea by Phil, and it was something that I actually managed to put into practice in, in the laboratory, and we completed this natural product synthesis. Phil partly owned a, a company at that time, and this chemical development was taken by the company, and they actually sell the natural product. So, there's no doubt that medicinal chemistry plays a key role in drug discovery, obviously in the design and synthesis of molecules, but something that's really important to appreciate is there's many other disciplines involved in the discovery of new medicines. And this is just talking in the preclinical phase. So this is before we've actually taken a medicine into the clinic. So we work with cross-functional partners across a range of um, different disciplines. I've spoken about medicinal chemistry. Process chemistry effectively scales the medicine up into kilogram batches. Pharmacology works on animal models. We've got toxicologists looking at safety of compounds. Biology obviously plays a key role um, in many ways, but one is in the identification of new biological targets that play a role in human disease. Computational chemistry, I think, has been around a while, but it's about now to take, I think, a real, a real leap forward, particularly now with artificial intelligence. So just quickly, I just wanted to take you through a typical drug discovery testing scheme because you know, we've identified a biological target that we think plays a role in human disease. And what we effectively do is we screen thousands of compounds. We're looking for hits because we need to start off with a hit before we can get anywhere near a medicine. So what we do is we have a chemical hit. It may be very weakly active against the target. And then we do the synthesis in the laboratory. Then we test... Um, compounds, initially what we call a primary assay, and effectively that's just looking at how well the, the, the small molecule interacts with the target. But then as we move forward and we start moving towards you know, animal testing, we've got to consider the, the, the properties of the molecule. So we start thinking about things like solubility and permeability. Often biological targets are within cells, so the compounds need to get into cells. So effectively what you're doing along the way is balancing the properties of the molecules. When you get into animals, often when you take an oral medicine, you swallow the medicine, the medicine needs to get into the bloodstream. So we can effectively test that out before the clinic by doing studies in animals. And then, of course, we want to see that the compounds are efficacious, that they're going to do what we hope they do against the disease. And we can get a preliminary readout by using animal models. We also need to assess the safety of, of compounds as well, because as everyone knows, you know, medicines need to be safe. So at the end of the day, we started out with probably thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of compounds, and at the end we come out with a candidate, which is optimised for testing in humans. So what I want to just share with you now is the difference between, you know, interacting with a biological target in a test tube than interacting with the biological target in the body. This is a different scenario, and it's much more complex in the body. So in the first step of that testing flow scheme, effectively you've got the purified protein in a test tube, and you're adding the compound directly to the target. And that's very, very useful as a first step. But of course, the body is designed to effectively keep molecules out of the body. We've got lots of membrane barriers. We want, there's things that stop molecules getting across, and then we've got things like the liver that are chewing up medicines and getting rid of them. So when you're trying to actually hit the biological target in the body, that's a whole different game because you've got to have the right properties. So for instance, when you swallow a medicine, it has to be soluble. It needs to go and dissolve in the stomach. Then it needs to be permeable. It needs to get across membranes into the bloodstream. And then it needs to be stable, because if it's not stable against the liver, the medicine just disappears. So I just want you to just appreciate actually how complex it is to actually get a medicine to hit the target in the right compartment in the body. So this is a real life project. This was the project that I worked on in the biotech company, Factor 10A. Um, so this was a, a, an enzyme involved in the blood coagulation cascade. So inhibition of this enzyme will effectively stop blood clot formation. And so this had potential treatments for deep vein thrombosis, embolisms, and stroke. And at the time, we had a human x-ray structure available, 
which enabled us to do what we call structure-based design and fragment-based design. And obviously the goal is to deliver a safe and efficacious oral anticoagulant. And we used this very simple principle because we had the X-ray structure of factor 10A, which I'm showing on the left-hand side of the slide. We could design molecules to interact with that biological target. So we synthesize compounds, we test them, and then we refine and we go in this iterative process. So what I'm going to share with you now, don't worry that there's lots of chemical structures on here, I'm just going to share with you some basic concepts. So this was one of the first fragment-based approaches in the industry. What we did, we used a very small fragment, which is shown in the top left of the slide, to interact with a key residue in the active site of that biological target, and it was actually an acid. So if you imagine like the poles on a magnet, if you get ones that are the same, they repel. If you get ones that attract, it locks together. So here we've got a neg negatively charged acid, and we're using a basic moiety to interact with that acid. So once the fragment's locked in, we can then use computational chemistry to design molecules. We get what we call a docking score, the ones that look the best we then make in the lab. So going from the fragment on the left through to compound three on the right, we effectively built in potency for the target, which is very important. But when you get to the compound in, on the right, when you think about what I told you before about compounds that need to dissolve in the stomach and get into the bloodstream, this compound does not get into the bloodstream very well. It's basically it's positively charged, so it's good at interacting with an acid, but as a drug, it's actually not very good. So these compounds suffered from poor oral bioavailability, and factor 10A is in the blood, so you've got to get compounds in the blood. So what happens now is that we use traditional <coughs> medicinal chemistry optimization. We basically take that very basic moiety and we make it less basic. Making it less basic is a good move for oral bioavailability. In fact, the oral bioavailability went up. But actually what happened was that the, although the target is in the blood, there's also lots of plasma proteins. And if you make molecules too lipophilic, they stick to plasma proteins and they're not available to interact with the target in the blood. And I think this is just a good example of what challenges we face when we optimise molecules. You fix one parameter and you introduce another issue. But actually the breakthrough on the project came with series three. And it's actually quite interesting because it makes a lot of sense to have something to bind with an acid in the active site. But what we discovered, it's actually a, a neutral moiety that you can have to bind with, with an acid. And that was unexpected. But this gave us a compound with much better drug-like properties. In fact, this was the lead compound from the biotech company. I'm actually proud to say I made that compound. So that was my impact to the project. Um, this led then to a, a big deal with Eli Lilly in the US. So Eli Lilly were major players on factor 10A. Um, so this is a case of like the small boys beating the big boys, I think. If you look at the two molecules, the Proteus lead and the clinical molecule, you're probably looking there and thinking whether they're, they're actually the same compound. They are very, very similar. There's only a one atom difference. So this compound actually progressed into phase two clinical trials, and it looked really, really good. We were leading the field. But unfortunately, <coughs> in phase two, we saw some unexpected tox toxicology. So we had to withdraw the compound, which is, was a real pain for us. But actually, if you look at these, the situation now, there's many marketed factor 10A inhibitors. In fact, two of them are actually in the top 10 best-selling drugs for this year. So it's bittersweet for us. Um, the other thing that I learned along the way was this controlling of drug-like properties. You know, I can't talk about that in depth today, but it's absolutely critical of discovering drugs. And there's lots of principles that have come out over the years. And in fact, 11 years after the event, a paper came out from GSK using factor 10A as a, sort of as a case study. And it showed not only was the Lilly compound, but all of the marketed compounds were right in that optimal sweet spot for drug-like properties. OK, so let's just reflect. Um, PhD and postdoc was really all about organic synthesis and designing inhibitors. I've told you about structure-based design, which is a very powerful technique to design new medicines. I've spoken about fragment-based design and also how crucial it is to control drug-like properties when you want to get a compound to go into clinical testing. But actually, what's really nice, and now this is why we do what we do, I've spoken about two projects in my early career that both delivered me medicines. So there's some real take-home messages here. These are actually clinically validated targets. They've gone into people and delivered effective medicines. So for the AIDS patients that I told you about that were fe effectively facing a death sentence in the 90s, they now li live pretty ordinary lives. They don't just take HIV protease compounds. They take a whole range of medicines, a combination. Factor 10A also, there's now marketed all anticoagulants. The thing that I want to just point out here is that often... People that don't have a sort of chemistry or a scientific background, you know, consider all medicines as white powders, okay? And I totally understand that, you know, one powder looks like another powder. 
But let me tell you that the active ingredient in there is a de novo design molecule that's actually designed to hit that target. So if that's something that you take away today, then um, I'm, I'm very happy with that. So I've been talking a while now. So who could have a stab at telling me how much it costs to discover a new medicine? Any ideas? Anyone read anything? Millions of pounds, very good. Even higher than that? Billion. Yeah, billion, there you go. So, you know, you see figures bounded around. It's often claimed that it takes about $2 billion to discover a new medicine, okay? What about how long it takes? I spoke, any guesses? 10 years, really good. So 10 years is actually probably an early example of how long it takes. Typically, it might even be 15 years. So this is what this slide is showing, really, the, the challenges that we face and really the decline in productivity in the industry. This is Eram's law. So on the left-hand side, in the 1950s, even I wasn't born in the 1950s, um, there were fi around about 50 new medicines discovered f for... Yeah? Wait, is that a reverse It is. I'm not going to go into that. So Moore's law is how the sort of... I think it was like transcriptors in the industry went up. So this is the reverse. So it's a bit of a play. Good spot. But effectively, what this is telling you that... There's massive decline. So you're looking at 2010, and there's less than one new medicine discovered per billion dollar spending in R&D. That's 2010. So obviously we're in 2018. This is unsustainable. Okay, now is the time for us to change, to become more efficient, and do things much more cost effectively. So let's just go back to this slide and think about how, certainly from a chemistry perspective, we can really speed up the process. So as I mentioned before, computational tools now are becoming much more powerful. And now we've got this emergence of artificial intelligence, which, of course, everyone's reading about every day. This is impacting many different industries. It's sort of untested in our industry, but I can tell you it's, it's absolutely taking off. Okay? So I think there's an opportunity here for us to do a lot more virtual chemistry. So what I spoke about back in the 90s that we actually did is now that the sophistication of computational tools is coming, we should be able to do a lot more virtually and use also artificial intelligence. So for instance, why does it take us 10,000 molecules before we get to a medicine? You know, what can artificial intelligence tell us about all the marketed medicines? There's some real learning there. And it could be something that's actually non-human learning that actually makes some breakthroughs. So I'm actually very excited about artificial intelligence. I'm interacting with a lot of companies at the moment. I think this is going to be huge. The other area where we can speed things up, and we were actually doing this at Eli Lilly, is in, the, in automated synthesis. So I had chemists in my team that not only made molecules in the laboratory, they made chemicals remotely from their desktop. So we had the, the robot in the US. They were designing experiments from their computers and getting compounds made by robots. Okay, So this is real. So people say about medicinal chemists getting replaced. I don't think that's going to happen in the short term. But you can do chemistry with robots. And the amount of chemistry you can do now is increasing all the time. You can also do automated biological testing. So you can imagine a situation. You've got your desktop, you're designing molecules, you're making molecules remotely, but you can go from the synthesized molecule straight into automatic bi biochemical testing. So this is going to save a huge amount of time. So this is a sort of a fun slide. How's it all going to tie together? Well, you know, drug discovery not only produces huge amounts of data, it needs to access huge amounts of data. One of the, not a criticism, one of the things that I've noticed being in the preclinical space is when we deliver clinical compounds, they go off to the clinic, we, and we lose touch with them. There's no feedback that goes back into research. But of course now that we're in a much more sophisticated position because if the data is available, whether it's clinical data, whether it's scientific data, we should be able to not only access that but also look for trends. I think that's where artificial intelligence is going to really come in. And of course you guys know all about big data, cloud systems, etc. The other area that's really taken off, and I know that this is an area that the university's done some work, is with medical devices. So down in the bottom right, I'm showing you what's called an artificial pancreas. This is what diabetes patients wear, continuously monitoring their blood glucose levels, and then it actually injects insulin at the right time. So this is great. This is like a prototype. But why, why does we have to stop at glucose? You know, you could imagine a situation you can actually monitor any biomarker. We need to be able to measure biomarkers when we go in the clinic to show that our medicines are effective. So as you start out on a new project, you've got to be thinking about how to take the project into the clinic, and then you can, you've got to be thinking about the biomarkers. If you think about that early enough with the technology, then obviously you've got a real situation here. And I know from being to previous talks in London that you're working in this area. So I think there's some really fantastic opportunities here. So we, we, we're moving now from these traditional targets, I won't go into these in depth, 
There's newer targets coming through, protein-protein interactions. I know that you guys are, you know, you've got your new building coming out in immunotherapy. There's also other new approaches. So there's a big debate in the industry at the moment about what we call drugging the undruggable. So typically I've spoken about things that are proteins or enzymes. They contain very well-defined active sites. I showed you some pockets. We can design small molecules. A lot of targets now that are being linked to human disease actually have very flat pockets. We, it's very difficult for us to actually design small molecule inhibitors of a very flat protein. There's no way for it to bind. And this is why there's been the emergence of these protein-protein interactions. There's also ways now that we can actually, rather than blocking at the protein level, but actually block at the RNA level before you get the proteins. There's companies now that are actually degrading proteins. So rather than inhibiting proteins, they're actually removing them. So the technology is fantastic. The other area that's really hot is around biological networks. So rather than us going after single biological targets, we actually impact the, net, the whole network. And, and AI is being used in all of these areas. So I've started out recently um, as a consultant. I spent 17 years in big pharma and four years in biotech. Um, to be honest, this year I've just been sort of trying to see where the action is. Now the good news is that the field is moving on. I mean, the science and technology out there at the moment is overwhelming. And I'm trying to sort of make myself current as well. So I'm tapping into lots of different things. But what I can see, like with you guys, with your future worlds, is I'm seeing a lot of spin-out companies, a lot of startup companies. And I'm helping these companies not only refine their sort of drug discovery models, but also their business models and their pitches into industry. Because I know from being in industry, actually, how challenging it is to actually get your ideas across. So this is a bit of a fun slide. What this slide isn't implying is that Nick is at the centre of all the world's future drug discovery, OK? But what, it is, what I'm trying to show here is that previously, when I had this sort of entrepreneur in residence role, I was working in major pharma in one company. So my network was within a company, very, very small. My network now is going basically bigger by the day. Um, I'm tapping into biotech, startups, CROs, obviously academia. There's massive amount of new technologies out there. So I'm actually like quite overwhelmed with what's going on at the moment. But there's a lot of synergy there. And as I said before, that we all share the same challenge, which is to discover medicines faster and more efficiently. And so there's massive opportunities now to collaborate. So just as I finish off, I just wanted to leave you with a few final thoughts. And I think we touched on most of this during the discussion that, you know, drug discovery takes too long, it costs too much. And in fact, there's a third barrier now that where even when you get the medicine there's actually massive pressure on pricing and you've probably read about that so the whole disease you know the drug discovery model's really been squeezed at both ends we need to find a more efficient ways of finding not only new biological targets and networks which connect to human disease but we need to find clinical compounds much more efficiently human disease and drug discovery is complex i'm hopefully i've sort of put that across today um, and in some cases animal models can be poorly predictive of what happens in humans and so I always tell people that target validation really occurs in humans, okay? And so we need to get more hypotheses into the clinic and test them in people. The drug discovery ecosystem is changing, and we need to adapt through shared risk and collaborative approaches. And so this is great timing for people here to actually try and engage, but also reach out to experts as well. And, f and, and I think that will help you find the right partners for your research, particularly within big companies. So this university, you know, it's got a strong academic research groups. You've got the new immunology building. You've got engineering. You've got clinical facilities. This is fantastic. Research connected to the clinic. And you've got future worlds. So you're in great shape. So take advantage of this unique position. It's a great time. I think drug discovery needs you guys. And so uh, I'm here to help in any way I can. So on that note, I'm going to finish. Thank you very much. I think, you know, safety is a massive component of any new medicine, and I think the safety bar has got higher. So the FDA is very, you know, restrictive. They want to see that medicines are safe. There's that. But there's also, you know, payers, people that pay for the medicines. So you obviously read about NICE, which is the UK one. You know, there's not limited funds there. I, I feel caught in the middle because, you know, as a patient, you want patients to access new medicines. But obviously there's generic competition as well. So, you know, there's billions that get spent on research to get a medicine, and then you get generic companies that obviously produce the medicines very cheaply because they don't, they don't actually research the medicines. So, you know, I think we need to think about to pay a price for innovation because what I'm saying today is drug discovery has to, 
you know, deliver new medicines faster, more cost effectively, and then they're going to not get paid at the end of it or they're going to get paid less. It, it's, it's a big squash. I think what we expect as patients is you expect differentiation. So if you're a patient and you're paying for something that, you know, used to keep you alive for a month, but it now keeps you alive for two years, that's innovation. So I think we've just got to be realistic, but there's tremendous pressure. There's not an endless pot of money, and that's why R&D is actually being squeezed so much, I think. I think it's a really interesting area. I can tell you that in diabetes, this is hot. So there's whole companies now, small companies actually looking at these, these devices. And obviously the artificial pancreas, as I said, is like one of the first ones. I think actually thinking about biomarkers at the early stages of research is absolutely critical because you've got to think about not only how to take your research idea into the clinic, but how can you test most effectively? Even the clinical phase needs to get much more efficient now. So if we can have biomarkers, I've not spoken about target engagement as well, it's another very interesting area, but effectively you've got to be thinking about this. I don't know whether the technologies are going to be able to cover every biomarker, but to be honest, I don't see any reason why we can't go after that. I don't think glucose is the only chemical that we can measure using these devices. So I actually think it's a very hot area and it will get more important. No, not at the moment. I'm, I'm working with um, you know, companies involved in artificial intelligence, but I would be very interested because you know, the, what I was trying to show today that is if you've got an expert that understands the clinical experiment or the preclinical experiment, you know, people that have the technologies, they need to get together. This is, this is what I'm trying to put across today because it's crucial because the, of the timing. So I'm very happy to help. One of the beauties of being a consultant is I'm not trying to go into any certain area. I'm just sort of floating around at the moment. I've been going for three months. Um, I've got a lot of like pharma expertise, drug discovery expertise, but that can be applied in different ways. So I'm actually trying to see, this is why I love this concept here, because, you know, this didn't exist 30 years ago when I'm here. So, you know, the technology is so, it's advancing all the time. You guys know much more about the technology than me, but think about how to apply the technology to this problem. You know, I can help with that, and it's something I'd be very open to doing. So I'm not just restricted to just medicinal chemistry. Um, so if there's anything you think would, would be interesting, I'd be happy to, to chat with you. Um, it may be in a small way, but there's lots of companies now um, that focus on ne neglected diseases. So, you know, you might not want to, if you're a small company, I mean, Factor 10A was an incredibly risky target to pick because they picked what the big companies in the world were working on. That's risky at the end of the day. We beat them when we were probably quite lucky. But if you've got a specialist area like ne neglected diseases, there's, whole, there's other things. There's stuff going on with malaria. There's all sorts of things going on. So yeah, pharma might not necessarily be focusing on those things mainstream, but they're certainly connected into that. The advice I can sort of give you is, you know, get the innovation in great shape, but think about the end game as well. Think about how to take your ideas into the clinic. The more you can do that, the better chance you can have interacting with like industrial partners. I think the real challenge is for industry at the moment is that obviously they want to fill their pipelines up with things which are almost medicines. So there's massive competition, phase two, phase three assets. They're all over those. But the problem is the danger of that type of approach is that their early portfolio will really suffer. So if they don't start getting the innovation into the early part of their portfolio, you can't just thrive off of selling the things close to the end. So I think that if you can actually pitch your ideas in the right way, you're going to make pharma listen because they need the innovation in their early pipelines, there's no doubt. But to be fair, it's actually obviously harder to do that because they're going to be carrying more risk and it's hard to predict how things are going to work out down the line. But to be honest with you, as I showed, you can't predict anything that's even in the clinic, as we showed. Phase two compound, looking fantastic, boom, gone. So, you know, I think industry just needs to change its tact as well. And I think hopefully that will help you. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, artificial intelligence at the moment is, is being used for different things, like, you know, trying to repurpose medicines, look for diseases and things like that. I can, I can see that. What I'm intrigued about, though, is obviously now there's these algorithms that are being used to actually de novo design molecules. So... If we do a lot more stuff virtually, we know that we've only tapped into a very small amount of chemical space. We know that. There's massive amount of chemical space we've not tested. What I'm interested in is where's the, what I call drug-like space. Where are the medicines sitting in that huge arena? We don't want to be making 10,000 compounds.
probably my phone. Um, so I think virtual, the artificial intelligence can actually, what I'm interested in is what can we learn from the medicines, those things that are fully optimised, because there's hundreds and thousands of those. So how can we train artificial intelligence once they know how to de novo design? You imagine a virtual library that's designed from marketed medicines. You imagine a situation where we're designing future new targets in silico. Yeah, I understand there's caveats around crystal structures and whatever, but doing as much as we can up front in silico, we're going to have to make molecules. But if we can make molecules which are much closer to the candidate, rather than going through the traditional hit to lead process, to me that's only got to be a good thing. That's what I'm trying to encourage people to attempt to do. Whether we can do it, we shall see. <laughs>